I have a talk prepared, but you know, given the size of the audience, I'd be almost happy like to get stuck answering questions on like slide three or something. So I know everyone always says in these talks, if you have any questions, please ask them, and then nobody asks questions. But um, I see Stephen sitting in the front row, and I, he probably won't be too shy, and so uh, maybe he'll break the ice. So I, uh, I could get through all my material. I'm more interested in just uh, telling you a few little things. So uh, eventually, somewhere down the line, I'll have some slides that describe my research. But I'd like to maybe just give you a feel for some of the interesting um, topological spaces you can get by studying representations of the fundamental group of a three-manifold and a two-manifold. So let me begin very softly by reminding you that the fundamental group um, is a group that you assign to a topological space, and it's the group uh, that uh, takes as its elements uh, loops in your topological space that start and end at the base point. And, um, well, you want to be able to multiply them, so uh, the product of two loops would be the loop that you get by first going along one of the loops and then going along the other. So this gives you an operation, and to turn this into a group, you have to put an equivalence relation on the loops, and it's known as the homotopy well base point. So we want to consider paths. In this picture, you're supposed to think of the light blue and dark blue as two loops that are homotopic, meaning I can deform the light blue into the dark blue without pulling it through anything in space. So that's a fundamental group, and it's, a, um, it's a, an algebraic object that you assign to a topological space, and it's very powerful. And in fact, um, in three-dimensional topology, the fundamental group is the most important invariant. It's, it's not literally true, but it's nearly true that two three-dimensional manifolds are diffeomorphic if the fundamental groups are isomorphic. So it's a, that's not quite true, but there's a, you can make a, a, a statement close to that that is true. And so um, in some ways, studying three-dimensional manifolds really is the same as studying the fundamental group. Um, but group, these, the groups tend to be infinite, tend to be, um, they come to you in the form of a presentation of this say fundamental group usually when you compute it for a given topological space, you can find some set of generators and some set of uh, relations. So these are words in these generators and this symbol means you take the, the quotient of the free group generated by these elements by the uh, normal subgroup generated by these words. The R, our I's are um, our words in the X's. So an example of a group is a group like this. So this would be a group generated by two elements with one relation. And it's a, it's a difficult, in fact, an impossible problem to write down an algorithm that would tell you whether two presentations give you isomorphic groups. It's a, it's a well-known logical uh, logic problem that you can't solve. There's, there's no algorithm that enables you to, to tell from given two such uh, expressions of a group. I mean, for example, I think maybe this one, uh, I'll have to ask Julia if I got this right, but I think something like this might be true. Did I get it right, Julia? It, something it, so so these groups, for example, if I if I, my memory's right, are isomorphic, but it's not so clear why they are. You have to do some manipulations in this case. To see. So what's a perhaps a if we're clever, we might be able to think of a way to um, to study groups by um, by sort of applying a further process of turning a group into a space, and that's what uh, this little thing does here. So, so fix a Lie group. In the rest of this talk, after this slide anyway, the Lie group I'll consider is SU2, the group of two by two unitary matrices of determinant one. And look at all the homomorphisms from, the, from your given fundamental group into this Lie group. That is a topological space. You can think of 
homomorphisms, in particular as functions, and you can measure how far away two functions are, say, using a soup, using a soup norm, or just looking at how, on any given generator, how far the, part, the values of the two homomorphisms are. There's a little uh, caveat here. We'll uh, identify homomorphisms that are conjugate. So this means here I have two homomorphisms, H1 and H2, and I'd like to consider them equivalent if, if um, there's a, a fixed element in the group that takes one of those homomorphisms to the other. So in this way, we have this process of, of a three-step process. We start with a space Y, topological space. And we assign to it its fundamental group. And then now we've assigned to it um, uh, a new topological space, the space of homomorphisms of the fundamental group into the uh, group. This assignment is functorial. Uh, so if you have a home, uh, continuous map between two topological spaces, well, it induces a homomorphism between the fundamental groups and then in turn induces a continuous map between the, uh, these, these spaces called the character by the character. Um, notice that the arrow has been turned around. So the map went from y to y prime, and in this case the uh, representation goes the other way. The explanation for that is the usual one, that if you have a, a homomorphism, Y prime to G in a homomorph and a homomorphism from phi 1 to y to y. But here's H and here's maybe uh, so I star H is this So the arrows are turned around. Okay, here and there I pepper some some small font uh, comments. Those are just so if all of this is too simple for you, maybe I'm giving you a little more information. There's one, uh, one useful thing about these spaces, and that is that they are algebraic modules. So can I ask a question yes. about the base yes. point? So notationally, yes. you've suppressed the base point yes, definition. Yes. And that's somehow notationally useful. The conjugation equivalence kills that off anyway. Yeah, so first, suppressing the base point. That's topologists have been lazy since this concept was invented, and so um, we always suppress it out of no reason other than laziness. It should be, it should be there. Uh, but you did hint to something else, a little, little more profound answer to your question, is that if I change the base point, then it changes this group up to isomorphism, which is kind of a, a tricky thing to think about. But what that ends up doing is it changes the space up to homeomorphism or analytic isomorphism or something. So that uh, in the end, the choice of base point does not affect the topological space R of Y or the algebraic variety R of Y. Okay, so, uh, so I did mention that it's an algebraic variety. Let me just say a few words about that. Let me give you, for example, this for this group here. Um, if I wanted to look at, uh, let me first look at Hong of pi for this, this group here into um, into a, a Lie group G. So how would I describe a homomorphism from this group into a group G? Well, I would have to first decide where this generator goes. So I'd have to pick uh, a matrix or, or an element in this group G. And then I'd have to decide where this element goes. So I need to pick a pair of matrices in G cross G. Um, but in order to get a homomorphism, I have to make sure that, that those pair of matrices satisfy this relation. So I have to check that x1 squared y1 to the minus 3 is the identity matrix. And I can think of x1 squared y1 to the minus 3 as giving me a function from a pair of matrices, just back to matrices, just by squaring the first, taking the second to the minus 3 power and multiplying them together. And, um, and then this gives me a map oh, that I might call the relation map. And so you see that this is R inverse of the identity 
And if you think of G as SU2 or some sort of subgroup of a, of a matrix group, then you see that um, these, uh, the entries of, these ma of this matrix are given by polynomials in some particular. That's my explanation for the statement that these are algebraic varieties. Okay, let's see if I have... Um, Okay, this slide here is a justification for why I'm going to focus on just SU2 for the rest of the talk. But first of all, uh, in topology, when you, compact spaces are generally easier to deal with than non-compact spaces. And it turns out that for finitely presented groups, this topological space is compact if and only if the group is compact. So SU2 is compact, so that's good. Um, If I want to consider information that's a little deeper than just uh, what homology would tell me, then I should consider a non-abelian group. And um, so U1 is kind of the simplest group, but it's too simple. It's abelian. So the next simplest group, next simplest compact lead group is SU2. And uh, there's a little comment in red here, uh, which Maybe uh, it's a little bit technical, and so maybe I'll leave it up there for you to look at. But I, I'll come, I'll come back to it in examples rather than describe it. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Yes. So there's a notion of categorical question. I wonder if it's the same words like communication as well. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, so. In algebraic geometry, there's a notion of quotient. You have to be careful because sometimes if you just take a, a simple-minded quotient, you get a, spade, a quotient space that's not house door for something. And so uh, that's another reason why I want to take a compact uh, Lie group. So the answer to your question is that for SU2, it doesn't matter which notion I take. I can take the naive topological notion of orbit space, two points that are conjugated to become the same point. Or I can look at the... As a, this is an affine variety. I can look at its coordinate ring. I can look at the ring of invariant functions and look at the variety that that defines. And um, for SU2, you get the same answer. For, for non-compact groups, so if you were to study SL2 or GL2 or something, there would be a difference between those two. It doesn't, uh, in this case, take whichever one you want and I'll just take the nine. One more reason to study compact groups because that's not an issue. Okay, SU2, let me remind you if you, if you don't remember, it's a two by two matrices, um, determinant one and uh, equal A, A is equal to, A inverse is equal to its conjugate. Um, it turns out it's more convenient to just express it as a unit quaternion. So I'll think of uh, A, B, C, D as real numbers, and then I take expressions like this where as usual, I squared equals minus one, and so forth. And um, this forms a group. And uh, it, depending on how far I get in, in my talk, an important uh, subset of that group is the conjugacy classes of traceless matrices, mat matrices with trace zero. Those form a two-sphere. When I, in, in terms of quaternions, a matrix has trace zero if and only if the first, the real term is zero. So on, on the level of quaternion to trace, is, you just think of it as the real part of a matrix. And so um, this subset of this group is in fact a full conjugacy class. It's a conjugacy class of all matrices of trace zero, if you think of SU2 and U. Or I would, in, in terms of a, a quaternion, it's traceless. Another way to say it is purely imaginary. It has no root. Okay. All right. So here's a here's kind of a, a motivation slide. You don't really need to understand this, but there's a there's a, a, a long history now of studying SU two character varieties of um, two and three dimensional manifolds, and almost all the all of them have at their genesis, the study of a very interesting function called the Chern-Simons function. Um, so this, it's not so important you understand the slide, but if you know, if you know what connections are, um, you can look at 
SU2 connections on a surface or on a three manifold that forms a certain infinite dimensional space. And um, it's a space that's, that's, it's an affine space that's isomorphic to the space of one forms on the manifold, differential one form, with coefficients in the Lie algebra, little SU2. So to such a one form, I can form a, a certain three form. So if I'm on a, on a three-dimensional manifold, I can form this three form. I can take the trace to turn it into a real three form, and I can integrate it. So this is a function that assigns to a SU2 connection a, well, a real number, and there's some ambiguity, uh, which perhaps I won't, um, which I won't uh, discuss. But um, This is a, a little bit strange formula. It's a little more familiar if you study, uh, if, you, if you know a little bit of churn bay theory and you know about the second churn class, then this formula kind of pops out at you. But um, the important thing about this function is that its critical points, the critical points of the churn simons function via the holonomy are exactly homeomorphic to this space R of R. So I've defined something for you purely in terms of groups and fundamental groups in algebra. But why, it, why it's interesting in mathematics is that it, it arises as a critical point of a very interesting function in uh, differential geometry called the churn simons function. And so um, I will bury most of this in this talk, but the, um, the motivation for the ideas I'm talking about come about by studying the more the, by trying to study this function as a Morse function on a certain infinite dimensional manifold and forming out of that Morse function the Morse chain complex and the homology and viewing that as an invariant of the three manifold. So the, the context isn't you know I mean this is interesting but there's a there's actually a, an interesting backstory. Okay so let's let's look at some examples. I'll be happy if you come away from this talk having understood this one example, because it's a, it's a very pretty example. So I'm talking about the second example, the example with the picture. I'm going to um, consider the space Y is the two-dimensional torus, product of two circles. So one of the first things you learn when you study the fundamental group is that the fundamental group of this space is a free abelian group of rank 2. And um, so you might, um, you might think about how to, uh, how to describe its character variety. And I've written here for you a complete description. So let's imagine, first of all, um, the uh, the way we first think of the torus is the quotient of two-dimensional space by the lattice, uh, integer lattice. Uh, so we have um, translation in the x direction, translation in the y direction. And uh, all of us are familiar with the fact that if you take the R2 and take the quotient by this lattice, that gives you uh, the two-dimensional torus. But I can take a further quotient where I throw into this group the involution on R2 that takes here x, y to minus x minus y, so reflection through the origin. So consider the group generated by z plus z, the, two, the free abelian group of rank 2, and this extra involution. Fundamental domain for that action is sort of half the domain of the torus. If you think of the torus as being obtained by taking a square um, with sides 2 pi and identifying the edges, the domain for the action I'm interested in actually is half of that, so I'll go from 0 to pi. 0 to 2 pi, and I've indicated some, uh, some uh, sewing directions. Imagine making this out of a, a piece, of, uh, piece of cloth and then sewing this to this, this to this, and this to this. And um, so this object is called a pillowcase because it looks like a pillowcase. And um, my claim is that this exactly parameterizes the conjugacy classes of homomorphisms of the group, of the fundamental group of Y, which is um, from the beginning of rank 2. 
So let's say generated by A and B. So I've written a formula for you. Here's a homomorphism row. I, I want a homomorphism from the free abelian group generated by two elements, A and B, into the unit quaternions. And I've, um, since A and B are commuting, this, this group is abelian, I better pick a pair of commuting unit quaternions. And here's a pair. Now, they, they're actually complex numbers. Think of the complex numbers as sitting in the unit quaternions. So, you give me a pair of uh, so real numbers x and y. Here's a pair of unit quaternions, and then this defines a homomorphism because these two quaternions commute. Now, clearly, if I add 2 pi or a multiple of 2 pi to x or y, I get the same homomorphism. So that explains the quotient by the integer lattice. What's a little more subtle is that the conjugation action, if I conjugate this quaternion by the quaternion j, if you write down what you'll get is this is there's a vial group acting, and what you'll see is that the answer is e to the minus 2 pi by x. So that uh, this extra conjugation means that not only are x and y ambiguous up to adding of, of adding of 2 pi times it, or adding a lattice element of x and y, but there also there's an additional ambiguity that comes about by changing x and y to minus x minus y. So that explains why um, this space, in fact, is the pillowcase. It's you know, another way to think of it is you can take a torus and, um, and there's something called a hyperelliptic involution. It's a, two, a Z2 action with four fixed points on the torus and the quotient is this two sphere. So that's the character variety for the two-dimensional torus. Notice that it's an even dimensional manifold, but it has some singular points. Although it is homeomorphic to a two sphere, somehow those points are a little bit nasty. They came about by a fixed point of that Z2 action. And so um, it's best to think of this, at least as an algebraic variety, that it's honestly singular. These are singular points of that real algebra. Maybe the next uh, most interesting example is the so-called Poincaré homology sphere. This is a, th a three-dimensional, a closed three-dimensional manifold with finite fundamental group. I guess I could write down, um, write down its fundamental group. So sigma is the y is the Poincaré homology sphere. This is a three manifold that uh, Poincaré used to, as a counterexample to some early conjecture he made. He, he conjectured that any homology sphere was homeomorphic to the three sphere, and then a few weeks later, uh, right, found this counterexample. But what he found is that its um, fundamental group is finite. It's not obvious from. Um, let's see, I'll probably get in trouble if I try to write down the. Um, Maybe rather than, uh, th this may be true here. Um, let's leave this ambiguous. But the, the proper way to think about this is, you know, if you think about the platonic solid, the most, the most interesting one is the dodecahedron. And you can think of that, uh, the dodecahedral group, as a subgroup of SO3. SU2 is a two-fold cover of SO3, so it's the preimage of the dodecahedral group is so-called the binary dodecahedral group, and that's the fundamental group of this of, of this space. In fact, the Poincaré homology sphere is obtained by taking SU2 and taking the quotient, the coset space, modding out by the binary dodecahedral. So it's an interesting um, three-manifold. Its fundamental group is finite and it's perfect. It's for the first the abelianization of its fundamental group. This oh, so what was the answer? In this case, I won't explain this, but it turns out that there are exactly three points in this uh, character problem. There's a trivial representation. Every element is sent to the identity. 
but there are two interesting non-trivial, non-abelian representations. Essentially obtained by sending x to minus 1, y to a, a sixth root of unity, and z to maybe a tenth root of unity. There's, two, there's some choices of which tenth root of unity you pick, and that, um, that determines those extra two, the two non trivial ones. Okay, and um, there's, a lot, there's a lot known about these varieties. Uh, they're so-called so Briescorn homology spheres. Uh, these are uh, uh, spaces obtained by taking a number of complex polynomials that, have, that are singular only at the origin, multivariable complex polynomials, and maybe uh, taking... So, so these are links of uh, singularities of... Um, of complex surfaces. And um, there, there are formulas you can write down what, they, what the singularities are and you intersect them with the little uh, five sphere centered, or the little sphere centered at the origin in Cn, and you get these, um, these three dimensional manifolds. It turns out for these manifolds, uh, one can get some kind of handle on these spaces, the character varieties. Uh, here's a, a theorem that I proved a long time ago with Eric Klassen that said that um, each path component of this space is a smooth manifold with even dimension. And I'll, I'll suppress the, you can read what it says here, but the, um, the, point, the thing I'd like to point out is that for these manifolds, their character varieties are smooth manifolds. That's in contrast with the picture I had here, where for the torus, the character variety was not a smooth manifold. It had these four singular points. So sometimes character varieties are smooth manifolds. Sometimes they're singular. And um, it's actually rare for them to be smooth, as it turns out. Um, it's, this is kind of a beautiful family that, 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 uh, for which this is true. But in general, uh, they can be very complicated. Um, okay, maybe I'll, uh, I'll skip the rest of this slide. And I'd like to give you more pictures. Um, here's a good one. So I want to talk about the group I had. <laughs> so it turns out that if you take this particular knot in the three sphere, the trefoil knot, and you remove it from the three sphere and you look at the topological space that's left over, then you can compute its fundamental group. And here's a presentation of its fundamental group. And so, um, so now I'd like to consider the space of all homomorphisms from this group into the group SU2. Well, there's some simple ones. There's the so-called central representations. Those that take both of these generators into the subgroup generated by plus or minus one, plus or minus the identity matrix in SU2. There are two of those, and I've indicated them in this picture with the two red points. There's the ones where both x and y go to the identity. That's the trivial representation. And then there's one other where x goes to minus the identity and y goes to the identity. Those are the so-called central representations because SU2, its center of SU2 is just the, the group consisting of plus or minus. The group. Then there are the abelian representations. In the case of the torus that we talked about a minute ago, that was the only other thing. So maybe backing up, in this picture, I have just four central representations and everything else is abelian because you can see that these two elements come up are Mute. In the case of uh, a knot complement, the abelianization of the fundamental group of a knot is always uh, infinite cyclic. It's an infinite cyclic group, so it's generated by one element. And so you can ask, well, if you, I mean, what are the homomorphisms from an infinite cyclic group into another group? It's just a choice of an element in the group, because once you know where that element goes, then everything's determined, all powers of that element are determined. And so where you send it, it turns out, is determined by a single parameter. And I've 
I've written it here explicitly for you. If you pick any number between 0 and pi, here's a homomorphism. You can check that this relation is satisfied. Right? If I take, if I square this and multiply by this to the minus 3 pi, you can then and so that t can be any parameter, and up to conjugation, I can assume the parameter lies between zero and five. So that's an arc of abelian representations. And then what's most interesting for this knot is um, that there is an arc of non-abelian representations. I've written it down explicitly for you. Here's a family of homomorphisms. It, for all parameters, the first generator is sent to i, the, the fourth root of unity. And the second generator is sent to a conjugate of, uh, of a cube root of unity. And it's conjugated by something in the, in the j component. So you can check that, like, if I take the square of this, I get minus 1. And if I take this to the minus 3 power, well, everybody knows that if you conjugate and take a power that's the same as taking a power and conjugating. And if you take this to the third power, you get the identity. So this, this relation, well, you get minus the identity. So this relation holds. So indeed, you do get such an arc of representations. Um, and uh, what I'd like you to notice is that there's, it's, this can be viewed as a stratification by submanifolds. I have a zero-dimensional manifold of central representations a one-dimensional manifold of abelian representations, and a one-dimensional manifold of non-abelian representations, and some sort of singularity occurring at a couple of points. Um, here I've got a little comment for those of you who know the topology, that the Poincaré homology sphere that I talked about before can be obtained as surgery on the trefoil knot. And that uh, surgery is some, is some process where uh, you, well, its effect on the fundamental group is to add a single relation to the fundamental group, and in this case, the the um, three points I was talking about before end up being well. There's a trivial representation, and then there's there's one, there are two points on these green arcs that actually extend to the point of sphere. So from this picture, you can actually recover this fact that I had on the on the previous slide, um, this fact at the bottom here. So just understanding knots and their character varieties tells you something about the character varieties of surgeries. OK, anybody have any questions? Yes. Steven? This example is supposed to indicate that if you're lucky, you can actually write these, you can parameterize these explicitly. But in general, the only thing, I mean, when you first look at these varieties, the only thing you can say is that there's there's some algebraic map, and it's the zero, it's like the zero set or you know the preimage of a point, and then worse, you have to mod out by the action of conjugation. Conjugation, it's hard to get your hands on what these spaces are, but it turns out they contain a tremendous amount of geometric. Does it matter if you pick i and j, whether j and k or i and k? Or... No, those were all, those are all conjugate. So I can, for example, I can conjugate everything so that i goes to j. I mean, the important thing was that this guy and this guy commute. So you see, when t is zero, I've, I've as t approaches zero, these get closer and closer to commuting, and that's that's indicated by the fact that the limit of this arc is actually going to be. No, I mean, the way in practice you try to understand these is to use, maybe to take one generator and ask, can I conjugate to force it to go here? And then once I can do that, what can I do next? And, uh, there's a reason that's not uh, so clear from anything I've said. But for ciphered fiber spaces, um, uh, it's, it's not hard to see that something, something like like this has to be true. Notice that x is going to a, a, a fourth root of unity, a two times two root of unity, and y is going to a two times three root of unity. And there's some geometry that explains that. 
Here's a, another example. This one I really like. Um, it's the figure eight knot. So I'm going to take this knot and I will remove it from the three sphere. That will be my three manifold. And uh, this time again, we have uh, the, the abelian part of uh, the character variety is always determined because the, the abelianization of the fundamental group of a knot complement is independent of the knot. So we'll always have these, these two red points and this blue arc of abelian. But it turns out for the figure eight knot, there's a, the, the non-abelian representations form a nice smooth circle. So this is a much better space than the, than the better space than the trefoil because it does trefoil has these two bifurcation points, these two singular points, whereas the figure eight knot is as nice as can be. It's, it's, it can be made precise what what the nicest possible character variety can be. I'll give you some nasty pictures in a minute, but I can say what it means to be nice. And this one is as nice as can be. So it's just, it just comes to you. In this one. Now, I've indicated a little bit more in this picture, and that is that um, if I imagine drilling out a neighborhood of this knot in the three sphere, then I end up with a three dimensional manifold whose boundary is a torus. And what I told you a few slides ago was that if I have a continuous map between topological spaces, I get a continuous map between their character varieties that goes in the opposite direction. The functor R is a contravariant functor. And so um, in this case, the inclusion of the boundary torus, I didn't really draw it, but think of, of this black thing as being kind of thick and just look at the boundary torus. The inclusion of that boundary torus in the complement of the knot gives me a map from the character variety of the knot complement to the character variety of its boundary. A few minutes ago, I explained that the character variety of its boundary was this pillowcase. So there's a map from this variety to the pillowcase given by restriction. And that map, as it turns out in the appropriate coordinates, just takes this arc and maps it along the bottom edge. And this circle is mapped to a circle that maps twice around and has a little double point. If you were to look at it from underneath, you would see, you know, the two things kind of crossing like this to go, you know, you put like a big old rubber band around your pillow that goes twice around and it crosses once at the end. Okay, so um, this is a, a manifestation of a more general phenomenon, which is, which maybe I'll talk about, but I'll just mention here that the character variety of a surface is always a symplectic manifold. The character variety of a three manifold always immerses as a Lagrangian sub-variety of this symplectic variety. And this is kind of a, a very nice and simple example of that. Yeah, well I've said here, let's think about F of two-dimensional manifold, a closed surface of genus G. Then um, I can ask some you know, I can ask, what can I say about its character variety? Uh, that turns out to be a fairly horrendous space. It has, it has, uh, uh, well, the red, the red points. It, there are um, um, something like two to the two G red points. The blue curves are. Uh, something associated with the Jacobian of the curve. So it's basically the, the blue points in the case of the surface of genus G is a, a torus of, you start with a torus, you start with a 2G torus, a product of 2G circles, and you mod out by the involution. So it's, it's a torus modulo of involution, it's kind of just like the pillowcase was. But for genus bigger than one, you also have this huge stratum of non-abelian representation, irreducible, irreducible is synonymous in this talk with uh, non-abelian representations. And that's a manifold of dimension 6G minus 6. Um, it's a very interesting and, and very widely studied manifold. And, um, uh, but it, it's just the top stratum in a, in a fairly nasty space. So. Okay, just a few more examples. Um, uh, as I said, I'll be happy if I, if I show you some pretty pictures. Um, here's, a, here's an example of a, 
of a torus knot. I don't know, maybe this is a three, four torus, one, two, three, four. Three, four torus knot. Um, so you're supposed to think of this as a, as a knot that's contained on the surface of a, of a normal flat torus, the, the normal torus in the three space. And if I remove that torus from the three sphere, I get a three manifold. And this is what it's characterizing. It's, again, it's a knot complement, so it's got this blue arc and two red dots. But it has a whole a plethora of arcs of non-abelian representations. So, for Julia, these are all the roots of the Alexander polynomials where these things come out. For more complicated knots, this is an example of a knot called a connected sum of two knots. So I have, a, a, in this case, a trefoil and a figure eight knot that I've, I've connected, turning the two separate knots into a single knot. Uh, this, um, the character variety of this thing is, is very complicated. So it has not just green one-dimensional things, but it has green green bananas hanging off the, uh, the green vine. It also has a, a circle of, of non abelian representations. And um, one of the things that happens is that when you take connected sums, you're forming three manifolds that have so-called incompressible surfaces in them. These are surfaces that have cut the manifold or that, that lie essentially, in, the, in a certain way they, they lie essentially in the manifold, in the three manifold. In this case there's a, um, um, in this case there's something called a follow swallow torus, you can draw a torus in this manifold. And uh, that's, that incompressible surface is the source of higher dimensional components. So the, the it is true that I can I could give you examples of more and more complicated knots with the property that the character variety has components of higher and higher dimensions, as high as I want, as nasty as I want, singularities as complicated as I want. Um, the geometry of the space you start with has implications for the, the nastiness of the character. And there are standard tools in deformation theory that tell you how to describe neighborhoods of these nasty things. Um, I've got another example here. Maybe I'll, uh, okay, so in the very few minutes that are left, I want to tell you how one might try to put some structure and try to find something interesting to do with uh, these character rights. And there's an old theorem uh, that, as far as I know, first appeared in a, a beautiful paper of Atien Bott. Uh, and um, a related uh, a result appeared in the famous paper of Narasimhan and Shashadri. Goldman is, is someone who studied uh, this, this structure on character varieties. So if you have a closed two-dimensional manifold, then the character variety, well, it's not a manifold. I told you it had a stratum of, it had a zero-dimensional stratum of two n-dimensional, two g-dimensional stratum, and a six g minus six-dimensional stratum. But each of those pieces are manifolds, and each of those admit a symplectic structure. That's to say a, a non-degenerate differential two-form that's closed. Symplectic manifold is kind of a weakening of the notion of a complex manifold, and so um, it, it's Symplectic manifolds have many of the nice properties that complex manifolds have, but it's easier to be symplectic. And then there's a companion theorem that says that if you have a three manifold with boundary a closed surface, then the inclusion map of the character variety of that three manifold into the character variety of the surface isn't just an arbitrary continuous map, but in fact it's an immersion whose image is a Lagrangian sub-manifold of the symplectic manifold. Lagrangian is the counterpart in symplectic geometry. The notion of a totally real subspace is of a complex vector space. If you have a complex vector space of dimension n, and you, have a, and you look at the real span of n vectors, the real span of a complex basis, that's, uh, that's, that would give you an idea of what a Lagrangian manifold is. So Lagrangian sub-manifold is like that. 
the manifold of half the dimension, and it, uh, the symplectic form vanishes identically on the line. So, so these spaces have a lot of interesting geometry. You know, start with the three manifold, look at its fundamental group, create a space out of it. If the manifold was a three manifold, this space, a three manifold boundary, this space then becomes a Lagrangian submanifold of the symplectic manifold. And uh, so all the techniques, and there are plenty of them, of the theory of um, symplectic, symplectic topology can be brought to bear on this, provided you can find a way to deal with the singularities. Okay. Um, I think. I'm just going to go like this. Maybe I'll show you this picture. I don't have time to go through my whole, uh, all my slides, but I wanted to show you something. So, um, turns out that there's a very nice idea you can, you can do it. In topology, often, um, you don't want to study just, say, three-dimensional manifolds, but you might want to study three-dimensional manifolds containing a knot or a link. And if you cut a three-manifold containing a knot along a surface, then you see that the surface becomes a surface containing a finite number of points. So um, I, would, I would perhaps ask you to imagine that I start my talk again from scratch, except instead of just talking about man three manifolds and the boundary two manifolds, I consider pairs consisting of a three-manifold and link, and uh, their boundaries are two manifolds containing a finite collection of points. And so the whole story goes through. There's, um, there's, some, there's a little technicality that you have to address. But when you're done, um, so this, this is my, my notation for the following uh, pair. I take a two-sphere, and I look at just an even number, two endpoints, and I look at the character variety associated with that. I haven't told you what it was. It was on one of those slides that went by quickly. It's not so hard. But once you work it out, you see this is a smooth four n dimensional manifold with a finite collection of singular points. And now, um, if I have a three manifold that contains a co dimension one, a knot, or, some, or an object of co dimension one that's properly embedded, that is to say, it approaches the boundary, it intersects the boundary transversely, then um, just like we were looking at the restriction maps before, I can look at the restriction maps in this context. And uh, here's a few theorems. I'll just put them up here. Um, and, uh, it's what I've been working on recently. They're a little bit technical. I think I want to then just show you some pictures. Um, so more technical stuff. Here, uh, let's look at. Let's stop on this in this diagram for a second. I have a three manifold containing a knot, and in it I have a two sphere that meets the knot in two end points. This was a, this picture here. Here's a I'm, my three manifold is a three sphere. I've got the knot sitting in it. I find a two sphere that meets it in one, two, three, four points. So. Um, I can look at the character variety of the pair consisting of the three sphere and the knot. I can look at the two pieces. These are tangles. And there's an inclusion. And finally, I have the inclusion to the two pieces into the two sphere. And the theorems, the kind of theorems I've been proving recently say that although these can be singular spaces, there's a method to desingularize them. There's a way to perturb the equations that define them a little bit make them as nice as possible. And how nice is the, is the, is the subject of, of these terms? So here, for example, there's some complicated notation. But the, if you look at the conclusion, it says something's a smooth Lagrangian submanifold. Something else is a nearly smooth Lagrangian submanifold. So here's, a, here's the picture that I'd like you to come away with. It. If I have a tangled decomposition of a knot in a manifold, then I get uh, 
nearly smooth 4n minus 6 dimensional manifold. It has some finite collection of singularities. And in it, I get, well, one smooth immersed manifold and another nearly smooth, it may have some singularities, immersed manifold. And now um, I can probably finish my talk on time. If you have two sub-manifolds in a manifold, if you have a manifold of even dimension, 2n, let's say, 2k, and you have 2k dimensional sub-manifolds, the first thing someone like Carmen would do is make them transverse and count how many points of intersections they have. That would be a, a way to assign a, a number, an intersection number, to a pair of manifolds. Here, we might want to do the same thing, but in the presence of a symplectic structure, you can do more. You can do what some people sometimes call, you can categorify that intersection number. That is to say, you can look for a homology theory whose Euler characteristic gives the intersection number. That's something that symplectic topology gives you that just ordinary differential topology doesn't. And so that's, of course, the, the issue, the kind of uh, mathematics I'm pursuing. And uh, let, me, let me just show you in the last 30 seconds some, some examples of, like here's an example of, a, of a, something that happens for the 3, 4 torso. Clearly, I, I don't expect you to understand how I got to this picture, but I'd like you to see the pillowcase. In the pillowcase, I have two, so it's a two-dimensional manifold. In the pillowcase, I have two one-dimensional manifold. One is this immersed figure eight, which actually was depicted uh, here. So there's an immersed, take a big long rubber band and put it over your pillow over, over opposite corners to make it cross lines. And then I have another uh, manifold. It's a little bit singular. It has two singular points. And it's made of two components, a green and a blue component. The green, green component is mapped this way, and the blue component is a circle that maps twice around, just like the figure eight example I had. So if I hand this to Carmen, she will, uh, she will make them intersect, and she'll, she'll count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven intersection points. What I, what the symplectic structure gives you is a little bit more, it tells you to form a chain complex whose generators are these seven intersection points and whose differentials are given by so-called pseudo-homomorphic bigons in this symplectic manifold. And in this picture, there, there's exactly one bigon that joins this red point to this red point. So if you look at, at this shaded region, it's a, it's, a, um, it's a disk, it's a bigon. One edge, one edge of this disk is going into the blue or into the green region. The other edge is going into the brown curve, and they meet in those two intersection points. And the existence of this disk allows me to uh, compute the differentials in a certain chain complex and form a homology theory associated with this decomposition. Okay. I'll stop here and uh, maybe just show you that there are other such pictures that you can draw. And that's all I've said. Okay. Are there questions? Okay. Thank you. Maybe, maybe I have a yeah. question. From your point of view, from a pure topological or topologist's point of view, yes. um, do you have any motivation for switching from, say, SU2 to SL2C? Sort of the, the topic of complexifying transcendence is something that periodically becomes fashionable again. Um, yeah. Um, well, so I could take an hour and answer that question if you're going if you're to come. At pizza, I'd be happy to talk your ear out about that. Um, I, I don't want to, from what I was talking about today, when, when it comes to floor, Lagrangian floor homology, I, I don't think there's any chance of making that work in a complex case because 
non-compactness means that the, the kind of Gromov compactness you need to make all the differentials have d squared equals zero, all of that is completely out the window. Uh, uh, certainly, the complex Chern-Simons function is something that's very interesting, and I've studied in the context of character varieties. And even, even if you just care about SU2, it's often convenient to go to SL2 for the same reason as, you know, real algebraic varieties tend to be kind of nasty, or you can understand them better if you consider their complex points, and even if you only care about the real points. So there's a, there's a huge number of questions that can be asked and sometimes addressed by passing to SL2. SL2 churn Simons and Mariner are also kind of intimately tied with hyperbolic geometry. And, uh, but that's just not what this talk was about or what my current interests are. Yeah, it's fashionable. I mean, Taubes is thinking about it now. And, and, and you know, I, I work in this little corner here of some big thing, and you know, I know a little about some of the other things. What's your motivation for studying these things? Um, my my motivation is this: that the so when I wrote down the churn simons function, there are now complete uh, constructions of a Morse so-called instanton homology for the churn simons function. And these give very powerful invariants of three manifolds and knots in three manifolds. And for example, Kron this is all the work of Kronheimer and Rovka, and they, they, for example, they can prove that all knots have non-trivial, knot complements have non-trivial SU2 representation. But their machine is so big and involves um, uh, solve it. I mean, it, it's uncomputable. I mean, other than some very simple cases, they have no idea how to compute. And my, you know, if I've done anything in my career, it's always been to take something those those analysts tell us and try to strip all the PDEs out of it because because PDEs are nasty and delicious. No, they're not. <laughs> and, uh, and so my motivation is to try to understand instanton homology with as little analytic input as possible. Try to turn it into a nearly a combinatorial thing. And that's what these pictures are supposed to be. There's another, another meta-motivation, which is that there's a, there's a picture emerging in low-dimensional topology that there, there are things called Fleur theory, Hagar Fleur theory, Instanton Fleur theory, cyberg witten Fleur theory. And um, all of them are it's either conjectured or appear to be isomorphic to all the others in some very technical sense. And so it's like we're at this period in mathematics like uh, homology theory was 100 years ago where you know, people were inventing sim singular, uh, simplicial homology theory, differential form Durham, and eventually someone was able to see that these were all kind of different pictures of the same thing. And, um, and so I'm trying to invent a, another one, you know, uh, that appears, so I didn't say here, but if you, if you read the bottom of my slide, you can see that uh, one thing that comes out of these pictures is that all the calculations I can do are either consistent with known calculations or, in fact, agree with conjectured uh, calculations of other things. So, so to be able to compute something, that would be my motivation. Thank you, Paul, again.